Apsaris left the Far East after spending over 40 years there and travelled westward with his small band of nearly 50 persons to present-day Western Europe. He came upon a very large and primitive people who called themselves the Nishabads, which meant ground people. The Nishabads were into all types of crude magic. This was ripe ground for Apsaras, and he took full advantage of the situation. The Nishabads were a very friendly and caring type of people and were eager and willing to learn of the Hittion teachings. The Book of Nishabad is the journal kept by Apsaras while amongst the Nishabads. I have arrived in a strange country with a very friendly and helpful type of people everywhere. They are into very primitive magic and are ruled over by high priests. I have found that perfect people to teach. Our second day here we have set about making our camp on the edge of one of their unnamed villages. They don't seem to have names for any of their villages, or at least if they do, I have not come to understand them yet. When we come unto any strange people, it takes some time after using sign language to learn to communicate in their native tongue, and even longer to get them to understand the written Lemurane language. This is the reason I have to spend so much time in each area teaching. These people talk in a guttural language which is very hard to learn. We have been here for a week and I have learned a few words of their language and a few of them have learned mine. But although they are the perfect kind of people to teach, they have the hardest language I have ever come across in all my travels and I believe it will be quite some time before I can truly master their language enough for them to benefit from the Hideon teachings, but I know in time it will be well worth it. We have been here one month and have learned a little more of their language. Perhaps if luck is with me, I will have mastered their language enough within a year to begin my teachings. I have tried to teach some now, but because I do not know enough of their words, I am not getting my message across to them, so I shall wait until I am able to speak their tongue better. The climate here is harsh, the land rocky and mountains everywhere. The rivers are wide. There is lots of green grass and wild food everywhere. The days are warm and the nights are cold. The people eat wild fruits, vegetables, fresh meat and fish. Most of the people eat vegetables and fish raw and cook only the meat. The people have fair skin. Their hair is golden in color and their eyes are mostly blue, but a few of their people have red hair, green eyes and ruddy colored skin. They all seem in a state of very good health. They wear skins of animals about them and live in a type of tent also made of animal skins. A few of their people live in caves in the mountains. For pastime, they play a crude type of game on the ground with sticks, stones and bones. Their hair is long and shaggy. Most of their language is in grunts, whines and guttural sounds. The word for Nishabad sounds more like na aizaba. When they say it excitedly though, it comes out Nishabad the only sensible word in their whole language. After nine months of being with these people, I have learned enough of their language to where I can teach them. The others with me are not faring as well as I am having to do all of the teaching so far, but Archbishop Bhutan is getting along well with the children and old women and just may learn more about their language from them than I do from their young men. It's been a year since our arrival here and already ten of the Nishabad have joined the Hittion faith although that is such a small number in such a long time. We have a terrible communications barrier, and I believe we have done well in spite of everything. The first Nishabad to join our religion was a young woman named Eliah. She seems eager to advance through the priesthood, and I have made her a priest only one month after she joined. Her older brother Takar is also an eager person. Eliah and Takar are advancing very fast through the priesthood and are learning the Lemurian writings also. They have become very valuable to me in helping me with the QR Beth. We Hittians have started carrying on trade with outside nations and all Nishabad is benefiting from our venture. The name of this village where we have made our home is called Kroxo. There are about 200 persons living here. Elia and Takar are from a neighboring village which is far smaller than this one. There are no large cities or villages in the whole of Nishabad and this is one of the larger villages, most are smaller. The Nishabads are a very clannish type of people and like to stay together in small groups. I have been on my mission for 83 years thus far and have traveled over a vast area of the world and have much to cover yet. Takar, Takia, is a fair-skinned young man of 22 with long, beautiful golden hair and full beard and eyes the color of a bright blue sky. He has told me that he was born in a land across a great water, far to the northeast of here. He tells me when he was still a young boy, invaders came to his land 
and killed both his father and mother, two brothers and another older sister, and that he, along with his baby sister Eliah, Ilah, and his father's brother Hora, escaped to the land of the Nishabad where they were taken in. He told me his uncle is now dead, that he died a few years ago in his sleep. His sister Eliah is but 18 years old, the most beautiful young woman that I have ever seen in all my travels with hair like soft straw, eyes that are livid pools of sapphires, sparkling in the sunlight, skin as soft and smooth as a newborn baby. Elia is a happy, laughing girl, always smiling, always helpful, always graceful, always eager to learn new things. After spending five years in the village of Croxo, I and my band, along with Takaya and Elia, are starting out further north into Nishabad AMD make contact with other villages. We arrived in a high mountain village of Leug Liug, chief of a small fighting clan of Nishabads. They have been invaded by outsiders for so long that they have become a fierce, fighting army of men and women. Leug and his people have welcomed us and are eager to hear about the Hittion religion and I am eager to teach. There are about 125 persons living in this village, which they call Oxnan, which means meadow. Oxnan is surrounded on all sides by high mountains. A placid little stream meanders through the heart of the village. These people seem different than the rest of the Nishabad as they grow food in gardens beside each house. The houses are made of stone, with a fire pit in the very middle with the smoke going up through a hole in their conchal roofs. Each house has two small windows and a door covered over by animal hides. The roofs are flat, thins, stones laying over interwoven three branches, and then a layer of clay and straw is spread over these stones. The roofs never leak. It's warm and comfortable during the winter in the houses and cool in the summer. The family of each house sleeps on animal skins on the floor. They cook directly over the fire pits using clay and stone pots. They make a kind of large, round, flat loaf of bread in which they bake in stone ovens behind each house. This bread is very good as it's made of grains and dried vegetables. We have been in Oxnan for six months now, and about 20 of the Leug's people have joined our religion, but Leug himself is holding out. Early this morning, invaders poured down out of the mountains and attacked Oxnan. The invaders killed several of Leug's people while they slept. Some of the women were taken prisoners. Takar led me and my band to safety in a canyon nearby our camp, which was a little further off of the village. Elia was taken prisoner by the invaders. Takar has gathered titans amongst the Hetions and has set out after his sister and the captured Nishabads. I'm staying behind to teach. I understand that the invaders are called Magogs, from a land north of here. They have dark hair, olive skin, and wear shaggy animal hides around themselves. They fight with clubs, spears, and a crude type of bow with flint-tipped wooden arrows. I have been in Oxnan for more than one and a half years teaching. Takar and the Titans have not returned, so I have sent a runner to Caliph Lukia of Lati to send all the Titans he can spare to me, and I will lead them on to Magog to return my people. Everyone in Oxnan, including Leyug, have joined the religion at last. After eight months, my runner has returned with over 5,000 fierce fighting titans from lands south of here. Most of the titans are riding horses and carrying swords, shields, long spears, clubs, and explosive powder brought from the far east. We have started out along with over a thousand more persons from Nishabad, one of the mightiest forces I have ever seen, and are heading toward Magog. Our first day was rough going as we had to traverse rivers, mountains, and rough terrain. We traveled but about 15 miles the fifth day. We've been traveling for about two weeks and are nearing the Magog border. I have sent scouts on ahead to spy on the Magogs. We have camped in a pass near the Magog border and are waiting for the return of our scouts. The camp is restless. The Titans and the Nishabad army are eager to do battle. We have been here for three days and early this evening our scouts have returned to tell us that Takar and his Titans have been taken captive and were held prisoners in a large stockade not far from where we are now. They are guarded by about 1,000 Magog soldiers that have encircled the stockade in their tent city. Elia and the captive women have been taken to the capital Sith of Govik and sold into slavery. We plan to attack early in the morning, surround the Magog camp before they have awakened, and rescue Takar and our Titans. Before the sun has cast even its dimmest light, our entire force of over 6,000 men and women moved upon the enemy. We surrounded their entire camp, 
and before they knew what was happening, we swooped down upon them. Many of the enemy were slain, others taken captive, and but a small number fled with their very lives, terrified at our large force and modern weaponry. We smashed the stockade apart and rescued Takar and our titans. It was a tearful reunion when I met Bishop Takar once again. He is now 24 years old, but because of his capture and ill treatment, he looks much older. He tells me he and his titans chanted every day and did much axa power for their deliverance and always believed the power would get them out of their prison and also free his sister and the Nishabad women. After the battle, we have made camp on the spot and feasted and made merriment for our easy victory. We will begin our march against Govik in the morning. I have made Leog a Grand Titan and Takar has become an Archbishop. We all held high mass tonight. It was grand. More than 5,000 voices chanting. The power was so electrifying that a glow of light surrounded the entire camp and the power could be felt by all present, even amongst the non-Hittians. The Magog captives were awestruck and terrified by such a show of force and power. Although they did not understand the religion or what was going on, they knew that we had some sort of great power that they had never witnessed before in their lives, and they quaked in their boots. Late night we repaired some of the stockade and placed the captive Magog in it as prisoners and left about a hundred men and women of Nishabad behind to guard them, while our force of nearly 6,000 strong marched toward Govik, about two weeks away, northeast of here, on the barren plains. There is little water, even less grass, and the nights are bitter cold, but we will not stop until we have conquered the enemy and freed our people. Aradia tells us not to war, not to kill, but we must rescue our people at all cost. After we have been marching for our third day, a runner has come to us to tell us that 4,000 more Titans under Bishop Chua of Hatti will be meeting and joining us as Yakiva, one day journey northeast of here. They will be coming from Hatti. The runner tells us that the Magog know of our advance and are waiting for us with over 15,000 troops outside of Govik. I have decided to meet with Bishop Chua and make camp at our meeting place and gather more forces. I sent the runners on a horse to go south and send word we need more Titans. I also sent runners to the east to gather more Titans. Today we met up with Bishop Chua and his 4,000 Titans just outside of the village of Jakiva and made camp. Bishop Chua said that 10,000 crack troops from Lemuria would be joining us within a few days as the entire nation of Magog would be against us. So we will wait here. We have been here for seven days. There's a river nearby and plenty of good grass for the horses. The Lemurian army came into our camp this morning and this afternoon we are joined by 2,000 more Nishabads. This evening, a runner returned from the east with 3,000 more allies from our friends in the east some Hittions amongst them. We now have an army of 25,000 strong and will march toward Govik tomorrow. Early in the dawn's light, we started out 25,000 strong toward Govik, about one week away. Our twelfth day out, we have sighted the city of Govik in the distance, so we're making camp on the hilltops above the city for the night. The Magog know we are here. Our night we all held high mass and chanted. Early this morning, we completely surrounded the city from atop of the hills and showed our might upon the enemy. At my signal, everyone began chanting the purification chants. A long rider carrying a white banner approached us from out of the city of Govik. The rider came straight toward me and I waited patiently on the hilltop for his approach, still all of us chanting. When he was within a quarter of a mile of us, I gave the signal to stop all chanting and waited in silence for his approach. He came up beside me and spoke to me in Nishabad as he had been a Nishabad that had been taken captive as a young boy and raised by the Magogs and was now in their army. He spoke to me and asked what we wanted. I told him we had come for Eliah and our people and that if we could have our people back in our midst, we would turn around and return back from where we came. If not, we would move upon Govik, destroy it and take our people by force. I told the rider to return to Govik and relay my message and we would wait for a reply. As soon as the rider left, I sent word to each of my captains to tell the troops to camp where they stood and wait for further orders. We all made camp on the hilltops above to wait, and many of our army backtracked to a small lake in a valley below us to gather wild hay and water for the hordes. We built large fires, pitched our tents, and waited. This is our third day on the ridges, and the lone rider with his white banner is retuning once again. 
He came into my camp and told me the king of Magog, Jens, Sins, has asked me to return alone with the rider and meet with the king and him about my religion before he releases our people. I have consented to go, even though Takar and Bishop Chua are against it. They say it is extremely dangerous for me to go alone, but I have told them that the power is with me. I am not afraid and to wait for my return. Takar says if I'm not back within five days, they will attack the city and I have consented to their wishes. I gathered some of the sacred scrolls and started out with the lone rider toward the city of Govik. We entered the city of Govik, a crude but large rock city on the open plain, surrounded by a large stone wall with towers every few hundred feet. The city has about 15,000 people in it, but only about 15,000 troops are guarding it. These troops are on the top of the wall surrounding the city with their crude weapons. As soon as I entered the city gates, the people all went indoors and closed the shutters over their windows as they all fear this old Lemurian man with his great power and large following. I was taken directly to the center of the city where there stood a large palace of earth and stone and a few sparse shrubs around it. We went through massive doors into a large room and I was asked to wait before a crude stone throne. I waited for nearly an hour and was then told by an attendant that King Jens was approaching. Shortly thereafter, King Jens entered and sat upon the throne. I was brought a large wooden chair and asked to be seated. I gladly sat down. The king had the lone rider, the Nishabad come in as interpreter, and the king asked me about my religion. I told him through the interpreter about the Hittian religion. I spent the remainder of the day telling him. The king was fascinated and asked how he could become a member of such a religion, and I told him I could confirm membership upon him. The king said he wanted to join my religion, so I laid my hands upon his head, and he became the first Magog to join the Hittion religion. I spent the night in the palace of King Jens and continued to teach him more today. He has invited his queen, three daughters and six sons to listen also. This evening his entire family have joined the faith. The king has told me he wants me to teach all his people. I have sent a runner to go on to Takar and bring him here to me. The runner has gone but has not returned yet. The runner returned this morning alone and has said that Takar will not come, so I must go to him instead. I have told King Zens that I must return to my high priests and let them know everything is all right or they will become worried. The king has told me to go but return and teach him more. I therefore left and went straightway to Takar. I told Takar of what had taken place, but Takar believes it to be a trap and says the army should stay put. I confirmed with Bishop Chowa. He too believes it is a trap, so I have told them I wish to go into the mountains and call unto Aradia and ask him for guidance in the matter. Shortly thereafter, I left alone for the mountains. I have been alone in the mountains alone for three days, and Bella materialized before me and has spoken to me. This is what she said. Apsaras, you are troubled because you do not know whether to believe your heart or to believe your priests. This I say unto you. King Zenz is fascinated by your teachings and is in earnest as well as his whole family, but his people, the Magogs, will never accept you or your teachings. They even now plot on the best course to conquer you. They will try and kill the royal family. You must therefore go to the king and tell him all these things. The king will not believe you, but he will turn over the captives to you. After he has turned over all the captives to you, you must turn and go back to Nishabad. After you have gone, the royal family will practice the things you taught for a while, but then they will go back to the old way. The Magogs will never invade the Nishabads again. After Bella had said these things, she disappeared, and I came down out of the mountains and went straight to Takar and told him. Takar then said I should go and tell the king. I left and told the king, but the king said he could not believe any of these things, but said he would free the captives. King Jens freed a liar, and the 23 women held captive in the city of Govik. I waited and soon reunited with Elia again. It is a tearful reunion, and then along with Elia and the other women, we started back toward Takar, after bidding the king and queen and their royal family farewell. The king begged me to stay and teach him, but I said I must teach large numbers of people, not just a few, and that his people would never listen to me. He said the Magog people would never again invade Nishabads, but would make peace with them. I left with the women and went straight to Takar. Takar was overjoyed to see his sister again. They both cried upon meeting each other. 
the captive woman joined their husbands, fathers, and brothers. There was much crying and laughing and even greater joy. Tonight we hold a massive thanksgiving and made merriment. King Zhens has sent a convoy to troops from both his army and ours to free the prisoners at the stockade. The king, along with his chiefs of staff, came into our camp and signed a peace treaty between our nations. The king also brought me many fine gifts of gold and silver. Tomorrow we will head back for Nishabad. Early this morning we broke camp and everyone went in different directions headed for their various destinations. Some went east, some went southeast, some went southwest and some went south. We headed back for Oxnon. After many days we arrived back on Oxnon and the villagers were overjoyed of our return and to see that all the captives were free. They were overjoyed also about the peace agreement with the Magogs. Within two days, we will be moving across a small sea to the islands of Gaul to teach. Leyug has been made a bishop and will be staying in Nishabad to teach and bring more into the Hittion faith. There are many Nishabads that have now joined the faith, and we are told that we would always be welcomed in Nishabad. Like an...